Hello, as many of you know, my name is Dr. Michael D'Andrea. I'm the instructor for the human development courses at Springfield College in the Department of Counseling. This video may also be made available to other persons who are not necessarily part of the human development courses at Springfield College in order to help promote the relational cultural theory that we have been studying this semester and that is so important to get a full holistic orientation to different theoretical frameworks that go beyond traditional counseling theories that are commonly practiced in the field. I'm gonna be sharing information that is intentionally aimed at helping students in the classes for human development this semester to integrate their understanding of key aspects and contrast them with some of the very common theories that are oftentimes used by practitioners in the field and counselor educators in professional training programs. I'm gonna be shifting to share a narrative that I've put together and I'll be reading from that and adding some commentary as we go on. I hope you find this a useful way of integrating some of the key concepts we studied this semester. And for persons who are new to relational cultural theory, it is my hope that we can push this forward as a very important way of promoting healthy human development of larger numbers of persons from diverse groups and backgrounds than we have done in the past. Thanks for taking the time to see this video and hopefully it will stimulate new thinking for your personal and professional lives. This is an overview of relational cultural theory and the information provided in this lecture is designed to assist students in integrating the new knowledge they've acquired in studying relational cultural theory during the past semester. As we have seen, cultural relational theory is substantially different than the traditional theories of counseling that most practitioners, counselor educators, and students are primarily trained to utilize in their professional practices. With this in mind, this lecture will highlight key points that are intentionally designed to help students in the human development courses at Springfield College to synthesize foundational concepts that we have covered and are related to this new and very important theoretical framework, the relational cultural theory. I want to begin by stating that the relational cultural theory described by Jean Baker Miller and her associates at the Stone Center in Wesley College states that growth and healthy development occur within relationships and as people move toward healthy relationships across the lifespan. This theory holds that every relationship a person has in life results in healthy development or it can result in impaired development psychologically, emotionally, and behaviorally. A person's initial experience with relationship actually occurs during the prenatal stage of one's life where the fetus develops within the intrauterine environment and is thus impacted in the relationship with the mother with the mother's dietary habits, stress levels, and overall well-being. During infancy and in an ideal relational world, infants would be born into a community of people who understand the need for respect, empathy and love, which are viewed as to be as basic as food and shelter during infancy. With this basic knowledge in mind, professional counselors can do much to help educate individuals and develop psychoeducational life skills training programs that help individuals soon to become parents understand the rudiments of the relational cultural theory. In an ideal relational environment, children would be surrounded by growth fostering relationships. According to relational cultural theory, these relationships would be characterized by mutual empathy, authenticity, and mutual empowerment. These are three important concepts that we've studied this semester. These early relationships would form powerful templates 
within the young child's mind as well as within their body. And we've talked about within the body how neurological systems are impacted by positive relational community interactions. With these relationships established in early childhood, youngsters would develop their own and realize their potential, their untapped potential for relational co capacities. And they would in turn broaden their own relational worldview in positive and empowering ways that are developmentally appropriate in infancy and early childhood. Relational cultural theory states that infants and young children would then move from an immature dependence on caregivers to more mature mutually mutuality with others that are developmentally appropriate during infancy and early childhood stages within a human community that they are a part. Unfortunately, the world is not ideal. It's not ideal from a relational perspective. We know that in the United States alone, one out of every three girls and one out of every seven boys are sexually abused before they reach the age of 18. There are almost 1 million cases of child maltreatment reported in the United States each year. And there are countless other incidences of child maltreatment that are not reported at all. The relational cultural theory illuminates our understanding of the ways in which people who are a part of marginalized cultural groups are often subjected to what is referred to in relational cultural theory as power over dynamics. These power over dynamics constitute various forms of discrimination, marginalization, and isolation that result in devalued and toxic relationships that adversely impact human development from an early age with lasting effects across the lifespan. However, most Western psychological models of human development theorize that a child is born dependent and the goal of parenting and socialization is to make the child become more independent and autonomous as they grow with age. These Western models view development in a linear movement fashion where individuals move away from connection with the mother or primary caregiver in order to, to fulfill culturally biased notions of autonomy and independence. When there is adequate parenting based upon the recognition of the power that lies in building stable relationships, children will internalize enough self-esteem and self-concept from their primary relationships to move through life with a sense of ease, confidence, and healthy interdependence. Let's look at some of the key points going on in early childhood. The ages from three to six years tend to be a time that many children begin to expand their relational world outside their immediate family. Freud described this as the phallic genital phase that focuses in on the child's aggressive and competitive feelings as a result of being raised within the context of Western psychological theor theoretical concepts. Freud's focus on the child's genital excitement and the child's fear of retaliation by the same sex parent may seem archaic to many counseling practitioners today. However, as relational cultural theorists indicate, these views regarding Oedipal fantasies still permeate our culture in many ways. Erickson's psychosocial development theory, another culturally biased Western theory that's propagated throughout the, the training of professional counselors, focuses on aggressive drives during childhood, during early childhood. In his psychosocial model of development, the ages from three to five years are typically seen as a time that is referred to as initiative versus guilt. In Erickson's model, initiative describes the child's struggle to move forward with their own autonomous thoughts and desires. Erickson assumes that there are strong aggressive drives that leave children at this stage to struggle with their feelings of guilt 
during this developmental stage. The child's ability to manage guilt feelings and to keep initiating behavior is what Erikan defines as the successful passage to the next developmental stage. Like Freud, Erikson focuses in on aggressive feelings, not only toward the opposite sex parent, but towards one's siblings as well, as children strive to become autonomous and individualistic, even within the family context. In contrast, relational cultural theory looks at early childhood much differently. From the relational cultural theoretical framework, this developmental stage is viewed as a time when a child may be exposed to differences outside the family for the first time. The child can begin to interact with children his or her own age and learns invaluable relational competencies that include learning about sharing and negotiating individual needs. According to relational cultural theory, children at this stage have a growing ability to communicate with others within their relationships, and they can learn to adapt their communication styles in more defined and respectful ways. Intellectually, relational cultural theory asserts that children in early childhood live in a rich fantasy world and explore relationships, both healthy and abusive relationship, in their play activities. In short, this is a time when counselors, especially counselors working in school settings, can develop interventions that enable preschool aged children to learn how to communicate with others in more respectful ways. Fortunately, the Department of Counseling at the current time has hired a new faculty member named Dr. Joshua Edwards, whose specialty is in play therapy. Given this resource, I would encourage individuals to consider taking the newly developed play therapy elective course during your training at Springfield College. Let's look a little bit at late childhood from a relational cultural perspective, as well as from traditional counseling theories. The ages of six to 12 years were once turned as a latency phase by Freud, who believed that children at this stage were less focused on their genitals at this particular developmental phase. Freud felt that the child had resolved some of their sexual complexes and were now able to channel their sexual drives into more socially acceptable goals, such as schoolwork or sports. Freud felt that it was during the latency stage that a child develops a superego, which is responsible for their ongoing moral and ethical thinking. It was the superego, according to Freud, that would eventually help tame that wild id that rested inside the child. Freud's theory of human development was based upon human drive, such as sexuality and aggression, and asserted that development is a process where individuals are able during the latency stage to begin to develop internal resources that enable them to cope with an external world as individuals. Piaget described this period of development as concrete or operational phase. Piaget asserted that this stage is marked by logical cause and effect thinking. Piaget also stated that this developmental stage was a time when children could begin to take the points of view with other person, thus laying the foundation for learning how to tap into the untapped potential for empathic communication and understanding. Now, in contrast, relational cultural theory views late a cho a, a childhood as a time when youngsters can fine tune many relational competencies, especially from seven years on. According to relational cultural theorists, this is a time when children begin to take on the mother's or the caregiver's point of view and to develop a more complicated picture of the world internally. Children at this stage, are able to know people around them with greater depth and understanding. And in short, children at this stage are able to take in, respect, and value other people's worldviews as they begin to truly, truly be helped to learn to care about relationships in more complex ways 
than at earlier stages of their development. Once again, counselors in community and school settings can do much to develop and implement the sort of skill training that go on to assist children at this developmental stage to realize their untapped potential for relational competencies. Relational cultural theory asserts that later childhood is also a time of expanding children's relational awareness. This includes experiencing a full range of emotions in greater depth that are available during late childhood. This involves a more complex emergence of empathic competence, as well as a deeper understanding of the meaning of love and compassion in late childhood. Children at this stage learn to inter interact with their peers in many different levels and are more capable of expressing mutuality with proper guidance and support from older persons in their environment. And persons such as counselors who share a relational, cultural, theoretical perspective can do much to assist children in late childhood to develop in healthy relational ways. Adolescence. Piaget describes the stage of adolescence as a time when more abstract thinking develops. It's a time when individuals gain the capacity to be able to use two systems of reference simultaneously. In other words, it is during adolescence when individuals begin to develop relational competencies that enable them to understand the different worldviews individuals manifest in their environment. For Freud, adult, the adolescent stage is heightened by a cycle of sexual development that begins with the child's capacity for orgasm and extends to the individual's ability to also develop competencies that are necessary to be in healthy, respectful, mutually endearing, intimate relationships. These latter points are a fundamental part of relational cultural theory, which asserts that teenagers are at a time where great change and oftentimes confusion is manifested. The teenage body is marked by the emergence of new hormones as the child begins to surge towards adulthood. This is where relationships become sexual and the young person must learn how to negotiate a physical relationship with others for the first time in their lives. There usually is peer pressure to belong to the in crowd and this makes it difficult for more for many teenagers to enter into relationships with a clear sense of who they are, as there may be great pressure to belong to a reference group, a reference group process in which they begin to lose themselves. Now, Carol Gilligan, a pioneer of relational cultural theory, views adolescence as a time when young women lose their inner voice. Heterosexual girls, according to Carol Gilligan, demonstrate and begin to understand that boys are indeed interested in them sexually, but they also assume to learn, they come, soon come to learn that being assertive and strong, although a natural propensity and potential that females have, is not what boys often want. Thus, many teenage girls learn to leave out parts of their experience and development and they literally learn to disconnect from themselves, to disconnect from their assertive and unique ways of being in order to stay in, con in connection with male expectations in our society. Relational cultural theorists refer to this process as one in which young females leave large parts of themselves out of their relationship in order to be in connection with others. This is what is referred to as the relational paradox. The paradox being the desire to be oneself and assert their thoughts and feelings in an assertive way, while at the same time desiring connections with those who don't want females to assert such assertiveness and their own voice in interpersonal relationship. It is likely that a similar disconnection from one's internal experience also occurs when boys learn how to become a man in our society. Becoming a man in our culture often means losing their virginity with a female and learning how to dominate 
females in their lives. In the context of growth fostering relationships, however, children and adolescents can, and they do use their developmental processes as opportunities to develop skills and understanding the, the complicated relational world that they live in. They can be thought, taught, and they have the capacity to observe different ways individuals construct meaning of their world, and they can learn to respect such differences. They have the capacity to understand how and why power over systems occur in their lives, especially in the lives of persons in marginalized cultural groups in our society. All of these represent relational potentialities that counselors would do well to assist individuals in developing in early childhood, late childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood. At the same time, adolescence is a, is a time of great relevance for work counselors do in schools, community agencies, and other ecological systems. As children and adolescents are able to learn and value a system that is based on connection, to value respect, to value empathy. These are the untapped potential that we need in the 21st century in order for us to develop healthier and more mutually respectful society in a nation that is currently at a height of its divisiveness. It is the ages from seven years through young adulthood that people really can hone their individual skills and use new cognitive and emotional strengths to develop deeper relational competencies, even in the face of non-relational life experiences. It is hoped that this brief analysis of different human development theories, including, but not limited to Piaget, Freud, and Erickson, demonstrate how they sharply contrast with the relational cultural theory we have learned this semester. Future lectures that I will develop will focus in on other important roles counselors and student affairs professionals can play in developing and implementing interventions that are based upon relational cultural theoretical concept in ways that foster the development of an increasingly complex set of relational skills that underlie future relational capabilities. I hope this brief lecture is found to be helpful in integrating some of the key concepts of relational cultural theory and help you to gain a deeper understanding of how this theory differs from many of the co uh, counseling theories that are traditionally and to a large degree continue to be the centerpiece of professional training programs. I'd love to hear from you in your reaction to this initial lecture and to learn what the strengths you felt were of this lecture, as well as other suggestions that you might have that would enhance the integration process. Thank you very much for taking the time. Contact me by email with your reactions to this initial lecture, and I will prepare other ones in order to help end the semester on a high note. You've done extremely well as groups and classes this semester. I hope these, these lectures add to your professional and personal development. Thanks again, and have a wonderful week.